I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Melody McGill is a STEM teacher and coach at Roosevelt Junior High School in Modesto. Yeah. And she's joined by our team from the lab in the materials engineering division. And I'd like to bring them out and let them introduce themselves to you. Hi guys, it's a huge pleasure to be here. I'm Claire Robertson, I'm a cancer biologist studying how cells interact with their environment. Hi, I'm Monica Moya, I lead the team and I'm a biomedical engineer with a specialization in tissue engineering. Hi, I'm Karen Dubbin and I'm a material scientist and I work on biomaterials development. Hi, I'm Rick Hines and I'm a nanoscale engineer with a focus in biology and tissue engineering. Hi, I'm Javier Alvarado and I am a bioengineering technologist with a background in neuroscience. So let's give everybody our full attention and let's get started. All right, guys, so unfortunately, this talk has to start with cancer. Now, what is cancer? Cancer is a disease caused by an overgrowth of abnormal cells. And most of the time, the tumors that you find in the body are not actually directly dangerous. Like, for example, you can live with breast cancer for 30 years and not know. What, when it does become dangerous, though, is when it metastasizes. So what is metastasis? Many malignant cells, so many cancer cells, have the ability to go on the road. They leave the organ where they started and move to a different organ, for example, the brain. And this is when things become really dangerous. If you find a metastatic, a metastatic cancer in the brain, that patient is not going to have a good outcome. So the goal, of the, the, the goal of the work that we're doing is really to prevent cancer deaths. And the way we can do this is by trying to understand how does metastasis happen and how can we prevent it or even just find it earlier. So the question that, the question that then arises is how does metastasis happen? We have this process of cells leaving a primary organ going to the brain. How on earth does that happen? Where is it going to happen? And why does it happen? Well, this is an awful lot alike to a really stupid question of how did that tree get there? Or how did the tree in your garden get there? And you may think, you know, cancer and trees, they are absolutely nothing alike. Well, let me see if I can convince you. So imagine for a second you were a space alien, and you'd come to Earth for the first time to study these things called trees, which some people say were kind of cool. Now, if you were a space alien, and I told you some of those things are seeds that can give rise to trees, and some of them are not, would any of you believe me? I mean, they're all about the same size and shape. They have similar densities. How would you tell which one's which? This is a lot like how I feel looking at this slide right here, which is half a millimeter by half a millimeter of a primary human breast cancer. There are thousands of cells in that picture. Every single blue dot is, a, is the nucleus of a different cell. Some of those cells can give rise to metastasis, and some of them can't. I have no way to tell them apart. Well, think for a second. If you were that space alien coming to Earth for the first time, and I gave you this pile of mysterious things that could be seeds, what would you do? Well, because you're all good scientists, you might try an experiment. And what you might find, if you were creative and tried for long enough, that if you put some of these seeds into, into certain environments, they could actually sprout. So for example, you might find out that seeds really don't like bugs. But they need dirt, and they need sunshine, they need water, but not too much water. And you also might find that each different one of these items requires a slightly different environment to spread. And this is true for metastasis as well. It's not just the cell, it's also the environment that it goes to. What evidence do I have for this? Well, one really classic piece of evidence is that if you have a breast cancer, breast cancer likes to go to four organs in particular. It throws a lot of metastases to the brain, the bone, the liver, and the lung. On the other hand, lung cancer it can metastasize very readily. The problem is it doesn't go to the brain. There's something about the brain that lung cancer doesn't like. Instead, it goes to bone, lung, and liver. And there's some organs where cells never metastasize to. Like, it's completely unheard of to have a metastasis to the heart. In the entire history of Johns Hopkins Medical Center, they found six metastases to the heart. And think about how many cancer patients must go through Johns Hopkins, just six. So what this is saying is that the soil in the heart does not grow cancer. But there's something special about the soil in the brain that's really good at growing breast cancers. Now, what could that be? 
you're all experimentalists, and we know that there's an environment in the brain. What's in it? Well, it's remarkably soft. It's about as squishy as things in the body come. It's full of a special protein called hyaluronic acid, which doesn't show up many other places. It has no white blood cells. The brain is actually immunoprotected. So it's kind of like having not a lot of bugs. And last but not least, the brain is really, really, really sugar rich. So 20% of the sugar you eat every day goes straight to your brain. 20%, and the brain is tiny relative to the rest of your body. But what, what should these factors actually matter when it comes to growing metastasis? The sad truth is we don't actually know. And the reason why we don't know has a lot to do with the ways that we study cancer. So in my lab, I almost always have a culture of cells growing. What does that look like? So we grow cells in petri dishes, where they essentially sit on top of that petri dish, kind of like I'm standing here on this stage. They can grow. We cover them with media, which is an awful lot like Gatorade. It's got a lot of sugar and electrolytes and stuff like that. It's like 100 times more expensive, though, so please don't try to feed your cells Gatorade. And if we take a look at them in the microscope, they kind of look like this. You know, you get colonies of cells. In that dish, though, is there any hyaluronic acid? No. How, how hard is it? It is about as hard as this stage. It's extremely hard. Additionally, there's no immune cells. There's no supporting cells. There's nothing there. So to study these sorts of factors, the way that we've traditionally done this is to go to mice. The problem with mice is that mice are not people, and people are not mice. If any of you guys are large, hairless mice, get back in my lab. You're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be there. And mice, mice and humans are very, very, very different. Our proteins are different. Our lifespans are different. The number of cells we have and the, the metabolism we have are all very different. So what this means is if I'm curious about how sugar will affect the growth of metastasis, I can't actually study that in a mouse. So what this means is that to answer these sorts of questions, we need to build new test beds. But wait, I told you about seeds. I told you about soil. There's one last piece of the puzzle for how did this tree grow in my backyard. And that is, how on earth did that seed get there in the first place? And we know that there's lots of different ways that seeds get carried, depending on how big they are and what kind of seeds they are. Like you find seeds in your dog's fur coat. Or a lot of times, animals will eat seeds and then poop them out somewhere. And so you tend to get seeds in an environment surrounded by poop in certain places. But like that wouldn't happen in the desert. Now, there's no freeways in our body. Well, actually, there kind of are. We have what's called the vasculature system. So this is a series of blood vessels ranging from about that big down to microscopic, down to one cell size. And these different, these different vessels have some really different properties. Along with size, some of them are really straight, some of them are really curvy, and some of them even fork. Now think about when you're trying to get off the freeway. When there's a fork, things tend to slow down, they tend to become really swirly. Could this help explain where things are gonna end up? Is there some logic to where seeds like to spread based on the vasculature? This is another question that I can't tell you the answer to because we don't have a test bed to test it. And last but not least, one more part of the brain that I think you guys should know about is a thing called the blood-brain barrier. Finding a brain metastasis is actually really, really surprising. It's about as surprising as finding this little tree growing out of this rock. So this is a thing that really shouldn't be there. And the reason why is that the brain is really good at filtering stuff. And to tell you a little bit more about this specific filter called the blood-brain barrier, Monica Moy is going to come out and tell you a little more. Thanks, Claire. So the way that things get up into the brain um, is through the capillaries, so the blood vessels in your brain. And they have a really important job. They form what is called the blood-brain barrier. And the job is of the blood-brain barrier to act kind of like the bodyguard to your brain. It's not going to just let anything to your brain because the brain is pretty exclusive, right? So to better help illustrate what does make it across the blood-brain barrier and what doesn't, I'm going to have the team come out and do a quick demo. So come on out, team. So the team members are forming what is called uh, the blood-brain barrier, and each of them are representing an endothelial cell. So these are the cells that line the blood-brain barrier. Now, Sam is going to help me demonstrate what does and doesn't make it through. So you've got really small things that have maybe the right charge and are the right size. These things, they really go easily through the blood-brain barrier. However, large things, like this big protein here, these do not quite make it through the blood-brain barrier. Now, it's not just 
uh, whether small or big things make it through. Sometimes the blood-brain barrier helps get things across that the brain really likes, like Hershey's, right, chocolate. This gets converted into glucose, and um, the brain actually really likes it, and it will just grab it and <laughs> take it across. And then lucky for me, caffeine happens to be one of those things, too, that very easily goes across the blood-brain barrier. So Claire mentioned it's really surprising that cancer can make it through. Can I get a cancer cell, Javier the Cancer? So Javier the Cancer cell is clearly way bigger than this protein, right? And somehow he's able to make it through. How do you make it through, Javier? Maybe that's how it happens, who knows? Thanks, guys. Okay, so as Claire said, the reason that we don't fully understand how this process happens is because we don't really have a good model system. As she pointed out, we're not hairless mice, and yet this is where a lot of the cancer biology work is done. And so what we need to do is create um, better models. And so that's what this talk is about, is creating models to help us understand what makes it across the blood-brain barrier and how. And so we have two model systems. One is an experimental system that we 3D bioprint. And it's a physical system that we're able to test different things and make measurements and look to see what the results are. Now, we have a collaborator out at Duke that makes an experimental, uh, sorry, a computational model. And what this is is a lot of equations and math and so what happens is you take the input from the physical system, it gets put into this model, and hopefully what it puts on the outside is the results that predict what we see in the experimental system. Now for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on the experimental system. And the way that we build the experimental system is using 3D bioprinting. How many of you have heard of 3D printing or bioprinting? Yeah, it's pretty popular now. Really, in the last couple um, years, maybe even the last decade, we've seen a lot of sort of splashy headlines of what people are doing with bioprinting. You know, astronauts are bioprinting now in space. We're using 3D bioprinting to create simple organs like the ears or the bladder. Um, and so there's a lot of potential for this technology. We're not really printing, um, you know, large organs. We're printing sort of bite-sized versions of human physiology so that we can do these experiments. Now, our printers look a little bit different, too, than the printers that maybe some of you might have in some of your classrooms. So this is what our printer looks like. One obvious thing is, is that our printer is in a bubble. And the reason we do this is because we're printing with live cells. And these cells, um, we don't want to get their germs, and we don't want to get our germs on them. So that's why it's in a bubble. Now, the magic really happens here, indicated by the pink circle. Um, in there, you see the syringe, which holds the materials in the cells, and the nozzle is where the material comes out of. So this is a quick video that just shows the printer in action. So here you see the printer. It's extruding out the material, um, and it's forming the different patterns and shape that we want to. And it's printing into a reactor, and Rick, in a couple of minutes, will come out and tell us what this reactor does and how it functions um, with the print. Now, people call it 3D bioprinting, but I always say that you should just call it 4D bioprinting because the fourth dimension is time, and it's absolutely the most important dimension when you're talking about printing with living cells, mainly because we want to keep these cells alive through the entire process. So we want to make sure that they stay alive in the preprint process, so before we load them into the syringe, while they're being printed, and then finally the post-print process. And this last step is really where all the magic happens because once we've printed our tissue, we now have to continue to culture it so that it can grow. And that's where we then start to see the, that's where we then start to do the experiments on. Now the question I always get when I tell people that I'm 3D bioprinting is what in the world are you actually printing with? Because some of you that have printed with 3D printers know that you can use plastic, but you can't put cells in plastic because that's not the environment that they're used to. I'm not made out of plastic, and so the cells don't like that environment. So one of the inks that we use is called a self-assembled bio-ink. So these are inks where the materials that we're choosing are materials that the cells recognize. So for example, one of the materials we print with is fibrinogen and thrombin, which is circulating in your bloodstream right now, and when you cut yourself, it forms a blood clot. So the reason we print with this blood clot is because the cells know that they can remodel that environment. So these pictures that you see here, 
they started off as little tiny dots. And then, because we put them in this material that they recognize, they form these beautiful blood vessels. Now, a lot of the materials that we print with tend to be kind of soft. So imagine if I stack a bunch of soft things, they're all gonna kind of collapse on each other. So we use what is called a support bath, sometimes to print our materials. And this support bath is kind of like one of those ball pits at Chuck E. Cheese. You know, you've ever jumped into it? You don't sink to the bottom, right? And the reason you don't sink to the bottom is because you've got these little particulates of balls that kind of hold you up. And so this material that is a support system is exactly that. It's little particulates that hold up the soft material. Now, we've been talking a lot about creating capillaries and blood vessels, and so the way that we can create this is using coaxial nozzles, which is just a needle within another needle, and it extrudes out kind of what looks like a macaroni. Um, and so that hollow part on the inside is where we can then seed endothelial cells and introduce media. Now, Claire mentioned that the vasculature in your brain isn't just always straight. It has curves, it branches, and so one of the materials that we can use to create this branching is fugitive inks. We call them fugitive inks because they don't stay around for very long. Um, we print them and then print around them and then we make them go away, oftentimes with just temperature. So these particular fugitive inks melt at cold temperatures and so we can put this in the refrigerator and then suck out the material and what's left is a channel that we can then introduce cells and media through. And then lastly, we do sometimes print with things that are not alive. We sometimes print with silicones or plastic. And the reason we do this is because we have to be able to put our 3D structure somewhere. And so we can create this um, bioreactor, um, and that's where we can then print the rest of the biomaterials into. Now to talk about what goes into designing a biomaterial, I'm going to have uh, Karen, who's a material scientist, tell us a little bit about what are the different considerations when you're printing and creating the ink. Thanks, Monica. So Monica just told you about a bunch of different type of, types of biomaterials that we can use for bioprinting. And so you might be thinking, that's kind of a lot of materials. How do we choose which one to use? And the answer is that it sort of depends on what you're, you're printing. So as Monica and Claire both mentioned, we're interested in modeling the blood-brain barrier. So for that, you might use different materials than you would use if you were trying to model the liver or the heart. So when you're thinking about designing a bioink for your particular application, there's a couple things you want to think about. One of them is printability, and one of them is cell material interactions. Um, so first, thinking about printability. This is really wondering, does the material flow? So some materials are hard to, hard to squeeze out, so they don't flow continuously. Some materials are easy to squeeze out, so they might flow too fast and end up in a blob like this. And some materials are just right, um, so they print just the way you want them to, and you're able to pattern correctly. So to demonstrate this, um, I have Melody and some student volunteers to show printing, to demonstrate printing with household materials. Good morning. We have some assistance today from the Prodozies Youth Scholar Program. And so they're going to be uh, printing with different household materials. So we have, on the end, we have Vanessa, who's going to use gelatin. We have Samantha, who's going to use toothpaste, and we have Lourdes, who is going to print with maple syrup. And we're going to see how those flow outside of the nozzles. Ladies, let's print science. So as you can see on the very end, Vanessa's having some problems. We're a Lourdes and Samantha are able to print uh, with their materials. Thanks, guys. Um, so another component of printability is whether or not the print is able to maintain its shape after you um, handle it. So to demonstrate this, our volunteers are going to show, are going to lift up their prints to show whether they maintain their shape. So obviously, nothing printed for Vanessa. So that but you'll notice that the toothpaste is in fact holding its shape. Well, it printed, but it definitely is not the shape of the maple syrup. So let's thank our volunteers. Uh, so there's also some other components of printability, which is the right level of detail or resolution. 
So this depends not only on the material properties like the ones that we discussed earlier, but also on the nozzle size that you're printing through. So you can imagine a, a nozzle with a larger hole would print a thick line when a, a slightly smaller one will, will print a medium-sized line, <laughs> and then a really thin nozzle will print a very thin line. And there's not to say that one of those is the best. It really depends on what type of resolution or detail you're trying to get for the particular tissue you're trying to pattern. So to demonstrate this, we're going to use toothpaste, which was our best ink from the last one. And uh, we have um, some new volunteers. Yes. Again, students from the Pedrosi Youth Scholar Program. We have Louise, Candace, and Karen. So Louise is going to be printing with a very large nozzle. Um, Candace is going to be presenting with kind of an intermediate nozzle. And Karen is going to be presenting with, uh, printing with a fine nozzle. Ladies and gentlemen, let's print science. As you can see, as it's coming out, you can see that the large nozzle is kind of blogging up a little bit. The medium nozzle has a pretty good print to it, and the fine nozzle is, is a very nice uh, small print. But we'll look at those in just a minute. And again, all of these printed uh, sort of well, um, but it really just depends on what sort of application you want to use them for. So let's thank our volunteers again. Thank you. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, printability is really only one component of materials design. Uh, you sort of have to have a balance between happy or good prints and happy cells. So we really want both things that can print well, but also keep the cells happy. And so when you're asking what makes the cells happy, there's a few things. Um, one of them is cell distribution. So when you're printing a tissue, you really want an even distribution of cells throughout your print. Um, and some materials can help support this even distribution. And in some materials, the cells sort of settle to the bottom. Um, and that can lead to printer clogging or just a, a weird distribution of cells. Another component is cell viability through extrusion. So if you're imagining cells being printed through a nozzle, they're experiencing a number of different forces that could be damaging to the cells. So you really want a material that can help protect the cells during the printing process. Um, another one is cell viability through toxicity. So some polymers or materials themselves are actually toxic to the cells. So you really want to make sure you're using a material that either doesn't bother the cells or actually interacts with the cells in a positive way. And then lastly, um, it's the transport through the material. So Monica uh, mentioned a number of different materials, and some of these have large pores where cells can travel through easily, and some of them have small pores so that makes it hard for cells to travel through. And again, this really d depends on what type of cells you're using, um, which one is actually better or more, more similar to their native environment. But printing is only half the battle. And Rick is going to talk to you about some of the other challenges we face in making these models. Uh, so Karen just talked to you a lot about printing living things and how we do that. And obviously, that's a really important part of what we do. But it's really, like she said, only half the battle. The other half of the battle is biology. So the cells in our body are really highly organized. And through printing, we can only organize them so much. <clears throat> the organization in our bodies takes the form of tissues and organs and it allows them to actually perform their functions, like having your heart beat and your lungs take in oxygen. <clears throat> the environmental conditions in our organs are a real primary driver of how our cells behave. They, on they not only take signals in from each other, but they also turn to their environment for their proper cues for functioning. All of this takes a lot of time, and it's pretty challenging to keep things alive in the lab for long periods of time but we managed to do it, and before I go into it too much, I have to show you what the device that we're making actually looks like. So Monica mentioned before that we are making silicone walls that hold everything together and protect it from the environment. So we print them with our 3D printer, and then within those walls, we can put down a layer of bioink, or in this case, gel. This acts as a base layer. Everything else is gonna be printed on top of this layer. <clears throat> so after we put our base down, 
we end up putting down our fugitive ink. Now, again, as Monica was saying, a fugitive ink is something that goes away at the end of the print. So it will leave behind its shape within another gel, and you'll see what that looks like right here. So when we add the fugitive ink, we then cover it all with an extra layer of gel. We can then heat this up, and the base gel and the top gel will meld together, forming kind of one solid unit. After that, <clears throat> excuse me, we can liquefy our fugitive ink by cooling it down slightly and then suction it out gently, and what's left behind is the shape of channels, basically tubes running through our gel. From there, we can insert our endothelial cells by suspending them in a liquid and injecting them inside, allowing them to attach to the walls. So we gotta keep those endothelial cells alive and happy, but unfortunately, we don't have the luxuries that our bodies do and have a heart and lungs to do this for us. So instead, we have to turn to technology for help. So pictured on the right-hand side is a very precise and sophisticated pumping system that controls the nutrient delivery in all of our devices. And the way that it does that is through using our microfluidic system. Uh, fluidics is just a fancy way of saying moving fluids from point A to point B, effectively. So what ends up happening here is our pump box uses pressurized air, which is delivered through this tube here. It passes through a few filters to keep it clean. It enters the media reservoir at the beginning of the series. This pressurizes uh, the nutrient-filled liquid inside, then tries to get out because all this high pressure inside, it tries to find a point of release. And the only place it can go is into the line leading out of the bottle. Once it enters that line, it drives down to the flow rate sensor. This is kind of the most important component of our fluidics. The sensor is actually able to maintain the flow rate of fluid moving through our lines and make sure that the liquid is always moving at the same speed before it hits the bioreactor. We set our flow rate to 10 microliters per minute. That's, if you think about your liter of milk at home, it's about 100,000 times smaller than that. So it's very small amounts of liquid, but it's perfect for our cells. So once the fluid gets into the bioreactor, that's when it starts to move through the endothelial channels where it can deliver nutrients and oxygen to our cells and whisk away any waste they might be building up. The spent media then leaves the reactor and is collected in an exit media reservoir. From there, we can perform further analysis on it if we wish. I'm not gonna talk about that today. Instead, I'm going to show you what a happy blood vessel looks like. So pictured on the right is an image of us kind of looking up through the bottom of one of our printed channels. And those green things there, that's, that's all endothelial cells growing. Specifically what it is is what we call the cytoskeleton. It's basically a protein skeleton that each cell has that allows it to move and grab onto each other. And if you look real closely at the image, you can kind of see that all their little skeletons are aligned in the direction that the flow is happening. That's really important because if I took a blood vessel out of my body and stained it for the cytoskeleton and took a look under a microscope, I would expect to see something very similar. So that's good. That means that we're giving the cells an environment that's actually allowing them to form that blood vessel. If you look at the image on the right, if we let these blood vessels grow long enough, they start to adapt to their environment and begin sprouting into it, forming really, really small blood vessels off of the one we printed. And this is critical because really it's showing that we've given the cells an environment that they can adapt to and remodel and start to behave like they would in the brain. So that was kind of just a simple, kind of boring straight channel, but we can print pretty much as arbitrarily complex as we wanna be. So in the upper left-hand image is an image of a branching channel. It branches twice, and each branching makes the vessel a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller, and then it grows back together. This is kind of a small model of your circulatory system. Your blood vessels start large, they go small, and then they get large again before they get to the heart. So here in these images, what we're looking at really are these little glowing beads that we flow through the device so that we can see what our channel shapes look like. So in the image on the bottom, we have eight channels side by side, and the image, what it's showing you is as if we cut those channels directly down the middle and look down them like tunnels to see, well, how circular are the channels that we're printing? How close to a real blood vessel are they? And they turn out to be pretty close. If you look at the image, or I'm sorry, the video on the right, you can see here we're flowing beads through the channel. So we have the beads suspended in the liquid, we're pushing them through. Uh, when it gets really bright, we're using a high pressure, lots of beads are flowing, so the microscope is seeing a lot of light. When it's going slowly, it gets very dim, the beads aren't moving as fast. But if you look really closely, you can actually see that the vessel size is changing based on the speed and the pressure. So higher pressures, the channel is getting larger. On the lower pressures, it's starting to shrink. Again, this is something that happens, it's happening in our bodies right now. Uh, <clears throat> so again, now we've given the cells an environment that they can form a blood brain barrier and it gives it the mechanics that the kind of the brain, blussel, brain blood vessels have anyway. Sorry, I think I'm still recuperating from the beach ball of the face. 
So now I'm going to introduce Javier, who's going to talk a little bit about the measurements that we do in order to get useful information out of our device. So I'm going to talk about how we test and characterize our bioprinted devices. And so what that really entails is, how do we know if what we're printing is actually working? How do we know if it's doing what we want it to do? And how do we measure that? And so that is going to be dependent on kind of like what this quote by Galileo says. So we're going to try to measure what we can measure through the normal techniques that we have. But in the situations where we don't have a clear-cut way to measure it, we'll have to develop a way to do that. And so that's going to involve the combination and convergence of different fields and different disciplines. So we're going to need to take a little bit from biology, a little bit of engineering, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of math, bring it all together so that we can actually make these determinations. Before I talk about that and to get into those nitty gritty details, I want to talk to you about models, specifically why we build them and why they're useful. So what is a model? A model is typically a scaled down version of something that actually exists in real life. So for example, you may have made a solar system diorama for one of your classes a long time ago, maybe yesterday, I don't know. Uh, it could also be a scaled up representation in, in the case of a cell diagram that you were making. Or it can just be something that you made when you had a substitute teacher come into your classroom one day and you decided to make a paper airplane. But wait, how does a paper airplane actually represent a real airplane that might land in Livermore Airport? They don't really look alike, right? Well, if you take a step back and think about it, they rely on the same physical laws and phenomenon so that they can glide through the air. So the same rules apply, right? So you got aerodynamics, you got drag, all those are coming together. And so if you take another step back and you think about it, it's a simple representation of something real, and you can also measure it, right? So if you throw it, you apply that force, and it doesn't fly, well, there's your measurement. Didn't fly, didn't work. If it does fly, how far did it go? That could tell you how good that plane was, how, could, how it could be. And if you want to ask yourself, well, how does wing size affect flight? Then you can, with a little bit of origami skills, change the design of your plane and throw it again, see what happens. And so with the characteristics of a good model in mind, being simple, predictive, so you know, being able to relate the data that you have already taken to what will happen later again, uh, and then also being representative and measurable, taking those qualities in mind, let's think about what we want to actually model. Because what we're trying to model isn't quite an airplane, but it can be just as daunting to model, just as scary to really try to tackle. And that is biology, and that is specifically the blood-brain barrier. So this is a really cool feature of the blood vessels in your brain. As Monica's mentioned, as Rick has mentioned, and as I'm going to go on and on about. Because it's complex. It's not just one cell type, really. It's got multiple cell types, and they're interacting with each other in really complex ways. And so if you're trying to, in, in trying to replicate this feature, you have to think about, well, what function in particular am I really trying to capture? And in this case, as the name suggests, we're trying to get that physical barrier that the cells typically make. But on the topic of cells, which are typically really, which are usually really small, uh, so small that you can't just measure them with your eye alone, you have to use a microscope. How do we make measurements on these guys? How do we determine who's who? Because they all kind of look alike. Even under a microscope, it might be really hard to determine if a cell is happy and healthy and if it is the cell type that you are actually interested in studying. And so what we can do, and I really think it's pretty cool, is we can take these molecules called fluorophores, and they have this ability to fluoresce. And so when you shine these molecules with a really high-intensity light, 
they get super excited, and they release that energy in a form of light. Usually, it's a lower energy. So if you shine it with a blue light, you're going to get a green light. If you shine it with a green light, you're going to get a red light coming from that fluorophore. And when I'm talking about the light that's coming out, it's going to be kind of glowy, like a glow stick. And so you can kind of think of it like giving the cells glow sticks and letting them do their thing. They look like they're having fun. But we can also take those fluorophores and attach them to molecules that we really can't see, even with the microscope. And this gives us a way to not only detect the molecules, but also a way to quantify and measure it. So we can say that a higher concentration of the pink dye is going to give you a really high pink signal if you're looking in a microscope or you're looking, or you have some sort of uh, way to uh, measure it. Same thing with the green light or the green dye. So this is actually really useful for some of the tests that we do, especially permeability, which is a measurement of how well the cells are able to keep things from crossing through. Uh, we also call it the barrier function. So good barrier function means that the cells are not very permeable. They're not letting things through a whole lot. Um, and that's partly because these endothelial cells, particularly the ones in your brain, express this feature called tight junctions. And this is the connections between them that one holds them together and allows the blood vessel to be what it is, and also keeps things from leaking through, usually. Now, if the blood vessel isn't mature, or it's exposed to something toxic, such as something that a cancer cell might put out or secrete, it'll make the blood vessel leaky. It'll be very permeable. And if we had our fluorescent markers, or yeah, fluorescent markers tagged, we'd be able to see things getting through our blood vessel. So what does it actually look like in an experiment? So we can take our bioprinted blood vessel and with our green fluorescent dye, inject it into the system and watch it flow through. And we can take pictures at different time points to see and relate how much is going through over, time, over a period of time. And so one of the cool things about this is that we're able to use image processing to get a actual number and value of permeability for the, the experiment that we're looking at. And so if there wasn't cells, we would see the dye creep through the sample much quicker and much more profoundly. And so the cells are really doing what they should be doing, keeping things out. So now that I talked about how we measure if things can cross through, let me tell you about how we measure how things flow through the system. Uh, we use this technique called particle image velocimetry, which is a pretty large word. We'll just call it PIV, and if I refer to it, that's what I mean. So particle means the beads that we are running through the system. And we're taking several images, and we're measuring their velocity, which is their speed and then also the direction. And so we can run those beads through the system, take pictures, and see how things move. And so this is actually kind of important because, as Rick mentioned, we limit our flow to 10 microliters per minute. So that's kind of like the speed limit on the freeway. It doesn't actually capture what is happening on the road. Some people are driving way too fast. Some people are driving a little too slow. Some people are driving just right. So how do we catch speedsters? Well, we look at where they started and where they ended up. So through the images that we take, we can track their position and see how it changes over time. And so for example, I'm going to show you two frames, and we're going to track these beads in particular and see if we can catch the speeders in our system. Oh, did you catch that? Who thinks the middle ones were the fastest ones? If you, yeah. 
What about the slow ones? Who thinks the middle ones were the slow ones? OK. So we're going to have to do a little bit of math to determine that. But we can also think about it in terms of like what's happening in the freeway, right? So if we're tracking them as they're moving through a period of time, what is that actually going to look like? So we've tracked their position, and now we can assign a, a speed based on how much they moved in those two time frames. And we'll be able to assign a color value for this. So the, the fast speeders are going to be red cars, and the slow pokes are going to be blue. And people in between, a little nice golden color. And so that tells us the speed of these particles at this time, right? So for those of you that were able to determine that the speeders were in the center, good job. As you can see, the slow ones were at the edges. But that just tells us our speed. What about their direction, right? Because that's the other part of velocity. Well, through those same pictures and analysis, we can also say that we know where they're going and how far they went. So that gives us these little arrows that help us determine their direction. And so now we have their velocity. And let's go back to those beads. So now we know what they were doing in our flow. So now let's take it back to actual data. Because remember, we actually have a lot more beads in our experiments. And we actually take way more images. And so this can get pretty messy pretty quickly. So the computers are able to track all of these beads frame by frame by frame for 200 frames and compute their velocity through that period. And so this is what it kind of looks like. As you can see, the slow pokes are on the edges, and they're not exactly driving straight. And then the ones in the center going real fast. So play the video. So why is that important? Well, remember, we're trying to study how cells, particularly cancer cells, spread to the brain. And so the way, main way that they're going to get there is through the flow path that we give them. And so if we replace those beads with cancer cells instead and see if they are able to attach, well, that gives us a way to test experimentally whether they're able to break through the barrier and interact with our system. And so the cells that are flowing through the middle of this channel are cancer cells that were labeled with a dye gay fluorescent dyes. And then at the end of this experiment, after several days, we look back and see if anything was able to get through, right? So we had our seeds. We had a method of spreading. But did anything grow? And at the end of the experiment, we actually found that cells, particularly the cancer cells, were able to not just attach to the walls. They broke through the walls and crossed the blood-brain barrier. And so we got cancer mints. And so I'm going to bring out Monica now to really bring it all together. So I want to bring it back to the question that Claire posed at the beginning of this talk. How on earth does metastasis happen? You know, I told you that the blood-brain barrier is supposed to protect your brain from things, and yet, for some reason, cancer gets through. And it's super weird, right? I mean, it's just as weird as seeing a tree grow out of a rock. And yet, both things happen in nature. And it happens because we have soil or cells that travel and somehow find the right fertile environment. And what's cool about the model that we created is that we're able to observe all of this happen. You know, Karen talked about how we have inks that we optimize and how these inks are not just optimized so that they look nice, but that they are also optimized so that they work with the cells. Um, so that, because these inks are ultimately what becomes the soil. Rick then told us how we can look at that spread process by culturing these in a bioreactor where things flow through. And the reason, of course, that we're doing all of this is because we really want to create models that help us to better understand the metastasis process. And if we pair this experimental model with the computational model that I talked about at the beginning, we can potentially predict where cancer is likely to spread to. Now imagine being able to go to the doctor and have the doctor tell you, hey, Watch out for this area, because this is an area that seems to be the most vulnerable for having the metastasis spread. 
What that will allow us to do is be able to create, um, have much more targeted therapies as well as early detection. And having both early detection and uh, targeted therapies are two things that are really going to help improve outcomes. And the last thing that I really want you to take away from this talk is that really this kind of work is not the kind of work that I could just do alone. It really takes a village. Actually, let me bring my village out. Village, come on out. You heard at the beginning of the talk, okay, yeah, they deserve a round of applause. You heard us at the beginning of the talk tell you about our, you know, our variety of skills and our, you know, different backgrounds that we come from. And it's really the skills, the diversity of the skills and the thoughts that come together to form this really fertile ecosystem that allows for this kind of exciting science to happen. And with that, I want to thank you all for being such a captivating audience and uh, allow for questions. Thank you.